Well, God bless you and welcome to this Introduction to the Bible class. I am Reverend Jim Melton, the founder of Faithful Stewards uh, Bible Ministries. And we are going to have a wonderful time in God's Word as we see great truths and great understanding when it comes to the Bible. Now, this class has been designed to have a syllabus, so you could follow along with it. And if you'd like to get one, just... Um, Go to faithfulstewards.com and request one. We'll send it to you free, along with any questions that might come up. Because many times if you have a question, it'll be handled in the next segment. But if you don't get it and you would like more information on some of the subjects that we cover, faithfulstewards.com will give you all the information that you need of where to get the syllabi and also for any other questions. Now, um, we utilize the King James Version uh, Bible, and you'll see why as I continue on, but whatever version you're comfortable with uh, that you like reading, feel free to use any one you would like. I'll be reading mostly out of the King James Version of the Bible. So, in your syllabus, this first segment is called, The Bible is the Word of God. You know, in John 10.10, 10, the second half of the verse, I being Jesus Christ, he said that I am come that you might have life that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus Christ said that he came to make available a life that is more than abundant. Well, did Jesus Christ tell the truth when he declared this? Well, if he did, then there should be answers in God's word as to how this more abundant life is available for the individual today. This biblical research class, Introduction to the Bible, is a tool not only to help you to understand the Bible, but to help you to live it in order that you can manifest this more than abundant life that Jesus Christ came to make available. That is the purpose of this class. We will not have the time to read every scripture that's in the Bible. This is a class on keys. This class will explain many of the basic keys and fundamental truths from the Word of God that you can operate God's power then in your daily life. Once you have God's answers, you can begin to live that more abundant life that Jesus Christ came to make available. So in 2 Peter 1.20, we see a tremendous truth. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, private is the Greek word idios, and it's often translated into English as one's own or his own. For example, in Matthew 9.1, and he, Jesus, entered into a ship, and passed over and came into his own idios city, his own city. Uh, in John 1 41, he first finds his own brother Simon. This is Andrew. He finds his brother Simon, and his own is idios, and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And in John 7 18, uh, he that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, his own idios. So his own glory. But he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So if we go back to 2 Peter 1.20, we read again, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private idios, one's own, his own, it's not your own interpretation. Well, since no prophecy of the scripture is of one's own interpretation, then you and I should not try to interpret it. Since no prophecy of the scripture is of one's interpretation, then no matter how intelligent or important a scholar might be, he or she is still not qualified to try to interpret it. Now that poses a problem, doesn't it? If the word of God is not of one's own interpretation, then either there is no interpretation, or the Bible, as the word of God, interprets itself. And that is exactly what it does. The Bible interprets itself. Now this excludes most people's approaches to the Bible. So the first key to understanding the Bible is that it interprets itself. And this is a class that assists you in understanding the great keys and how the Bible interprets itself. Once you understand these keys, you can go to any verse in the Bible and allow it to speak for itself. Because the Word of God speaks much more effectively for itself than any individual group can speak on its behalf. So, how did man receive the Word of God? Well, we're in 2 Peter 1.20. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private or one's own interpretation. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. The Word of God did not come by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, God. Prophecy is used of that which is spoken forth 
or that which is spoken out and is not limited to information regarding the future. Most people think of prophecy of something that's going to happen in the future. Well, no, it's, it's a declaring forth the word of God. So that which was prophesied, which includes God's word, the Bible, according to 2 Peter 1.21, came not by the will of man. In direct contrast to coming by man's will, God's word came when holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is not an assortment of man's ideas. It's not the result of the thinking of a committee of the greatest minds in the world. It came by inspiration from God. And in Galatians 1, 11 and 12, we read, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It's not according to mankind, for I neither received it of man. It didn't come from mankind, neither was I taught it. But I received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul did not receive the word of God from a man, neither was he taught it by a man. He received it by revelation from God. The word of God did not come by the will of man. It didn't come from angels. Instead, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by God. It was given by inspiration of God. It did not come by the teaching of, of, of man, nor was it received from mankind. It was given by revelation. The Bible is the vocabulary of men, but the vocabulary was and is the word and words of God. In Acts 1.16 we read, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, which God, by the mouth of David, spake. There's a great illustration of it. David's vocabulary, but God's word. God was the originator and source of the information that David had spoken previously. God's word was given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God, like David, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's no wonder that the Bible qualifies as the revealed word and will of God. And you've got a chart there. God by revelation told holy men of God what to write, and they wrote, using their vocabulary, the Word of God. Now let's look at a biblical illustration of how a man received the Word of God. We'll go to Jeremiah 36. You'll notice uh, in your syllabus, there's a little asterisk before it. Anytime there's an asterisk before the verse, it means you have to look it up yourself. I want you to get familiar with your Bible, because it will be your best friend over the many years you have left in your life. So Jeremiah 36, 1, if you turn there. And it came to pass, it's the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, okay, this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. Jeremiah did not decide by himself to write it. It was received by revelation from God. Jeremiah didn't get up in the morning and go, ah, I feel like writing the Bible today. I, let me see. Now, it didn't happen that way. God, Jeremiah, he just, here's what I need you to do. Verse 2, take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day that I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah even to this day. So the words that he was about to write, even the idea to write these words, came not by the will of Jeremiah, but rather by the will of God. God gave Jeremiah revelation concerning what to write, as well as the instructions as to how it should be written down. Now, the books at that time were not the books like we see today. The pages or leaves were sewn together side by side and kind of rolled up what we would refer to as a scroll. Uh, on page four in your syllabus, you have the Codex Sinaiticus. It's an Uncle manuscript from the fourth century BC. And first thing you probably notice, it's, it's, it's all in capital letters. And hopefully you're reading it uh, not left to right, but right to left. Verse 3, here is the purpose of why he wants Jeremiah to write this down. It may be, you know, God gave everybody free will. It may be that the house of Judah is going to hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, but that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and forgive their sin. God wanted his people informed so they could repent and turn back to only worshiping him. Verse 4, Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him, 
upon a roll of a book. So Jeremiah was getting his information directly from God. Baruch wrote down what Jeremiah was dictating. doesn't matter who records it. What is important is that's exactly what God says. God's telling Jeremiah. Jeremiah's telling Baruch, and Baruch is the scribe. He's writing it down. And verse 5, Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, Look, I am shut up. I'm under house arrest. He can't leave. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore, you need to go, because you're free to go, and you need to read in the roll which thou has written from my mouth the words of the Lord. So it was the words of the Lord that Baruch heard from the mouth of Jeremiah that he wrote down. You need to read these in the ears of the people of the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return, every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against his people. And Baruch the son of Neriah did, according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Sounds like a logical place. If you're in the Lord's house, read the words of the Lord. Drop down to verse 17. So they asked Baruch and said, Tell us how, tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Now, they take the words that God had told Jeremiah, that Baruch had written down, uh, that were going to the king with them. So verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month. There was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves or three or four columns, he cut it with the scribe's knife, all right? And he cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, not the king, not any of his servants that all heard these words. God had given his word to keep them from falling into trouble. God does not want his people in harmful situations. But if they refuse to believe his word, then what can God do? He will not overstep man's freedom of will. Now, verse 27. The, so the first edition got burnt up. Now, here's verse 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after the king had burnt the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah. And here's what God told Jeremiah. Grab another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. Let's jump down to verse 32 then. So Jeremiah took another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added beside unto them many like words. See, the king and his servants could not get rid of God's word that easily. God was trying to keep his people out of trouble by warning them. He told the prophet Jeremiah what was going to happen if they did not humble themselves and turn back to obeying God. The Bible truly is God's word. Men did not decide what to write in it. They received revelation from God as to when and what to write. Men wrote it by revelation from God, not by developing their own religious or philosophical thought, and it's not a book of fiction based on fables or lies. They weren't sitting around the campfire one night and going, hey, I got one. There's this guy, uh, Noah. Yeah, and there's going to be this giant flood. So God didn't like people. So he just had him get out of this big boat. It didn't work that way. The Bible was authored by God and recorded by a man of God who wrote what God told them by revelation to write. It came when holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it has been received by revelation from God. So, most people in the world today have neither a clear idea of what the will of God is or where to go to find it. Many think that God works in mysterious ways, that no one can really know or understand them. Well, that's not the testimony of God's word. In Ephesians 1.9, in your syllabus we read, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. He's made it known, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. In Ephesians 5, 17, we also read, Wherefore, be ye not unwise. God's telling us not to be dumb, ignorant, stupid, uh, not knowing what's going on. Don't be unwise. Instead, 
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, if, you, if he wants you to understand what his will is, he's got to tell you, and he does. God is clear in his communication to those who want to know. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 in your Bible. This also comes up in the New Testament, but God's telling Moses here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it's not hidden from thee. Neither is it far off. God didn't do an Easter egg hunt on Mount Sinai, put the, put the Ten Commandments someplace and hide them. And they all had to run around and f- try to find them that way. It's not hidden. The commandments which I'm commanding thee, verse 12, it's not in heaven that thou should say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it out, uh, bring it to us so that we may hear it so we can do it. And in verse 13 says, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Verse 14, But the word is very near unto you, very near, in thy mouth, in thy heart, purpose for knowing and learning the word, that thou mayest do it. God makes his word readily available so that his people could learn it in order to live it and then get blessed. You know, Thus, they reap the benefits that God presents in his word. The knowledge that is recorded in the Bible is priceless. It's extremely useful. However, it only helps those who are willing to do it. In Ezekiel 33, in your syllabus, Ezekiel 33, 31, listen to this. And they came unto thee as the people come. And they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after covetousness. Verse 32, And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do not do them. And Hosea 4, 6, My people... God's addressing his people. They're they're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, God's people are being destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and that can't be a lack of knowledge of current events or science or philosophy or history or mathematics or sports or computers. That's destroying God's people. There's only one reason that God's people could possibly be destroyed. They lack a knowledge of his word. In fact, God's people are still being destroyed today because they lack a knowledge and understanding of the accuracy of his word, which reveals God himself to his people. Here, Colossians 2.8. Beware. And when God says beware, you know what you should be? Beware. Lest any man, lest anybody spoil you, take you away as captive through philosophy and vain deceit or deception. There's lots of philosophy and vain deception out there after the tradition of men, things that men have dreamed up and said, or after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Christ has got to be the focal point here. All of man's philosophical ideas that contradict the true word of God may sound good, but really offer man nothing genuine to believe or to hope in. Mark 6:34. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people and he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Jesus began to teach the people because those responsible to teach the scriptures weren't teaching it. They were being destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Look at 2 Peter towards the end of your Bible. Hebrews, James, Peter. Grace and peace, 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied. I like grace and peace. And here, God is offering grace and peace to be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God or in the knowledge of God. You want more grace and more peace in your life? It's through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that has called us 
to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Yes, there's corruption in the world, and it's because of the lust of mankind. See, we get to know, we get the knowledge of God from the Word of God. How could we expect to have the grace and peace of God multiplied unto us, or to benefit from these exceeding great and precious promises if we're not aware of them, or if we reject their accuracy? Here is another one, Jeremiah 2.13. It says, again, God's addressing his people. For my people, for my people have committed two evils. Sometimes you think, oh, only two? Hey, that's not bad. Well, they're pretty big ones. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. God addresses his people, not those who don't want to know anything about him. He says his people have committed two evils. First, they have forsaken him, the fountain of living waters. God is illustrated here as having an unlimited supply like a fountain has, right? It's a perpetual spring of water. It just continues to run. It's always there. Then he says that his people, once they have forsaken him, began to hew off for themselves their own philosophy of life, illustrated by cisterns. Then it goes on to comment that these self-made philosophies can even hold water because they're broken. Sounds good, but, you know, cisterns, you know, here I have a 12-ounce cistern, okay? That's all you can get in it. Cisterns, which take work to make, are something that man makes. Figuratively, they illustrate man who has hewed out lifestyles of his own ideas, of his own choosing. When people forsake God, the fountain of living waters, just unlimited supply of whatever it is you need, you walk away from God and you hew out for yourselves broken cisterns, your own broken down philosophies on life, which cannot even hold water, they reap the negative results that their broken cisterns give them and not the positive results from the abundance of that which God has available as a fountain of living waters. Why settle for a limited supply that runs out just when you need it the most, when God, the fountain, the fountainhead of truth, the one who can meet every need, is available? The Word of God, which was given by inspiration of God, which was given by revelation, is the revealed word and will of God. It puts us in contact with God. To know God, we must know his word, because that is where he has revealed himself. We should not want to forsake God or his word, which is his will, and heal off ourselves our own way of doing things. That will bring no better results than it brought in the time of Jeremiah. God's word can be trusted, because God can be trusted. Numbers 23, 19 God is not a man that he should lie. Now, this is man as in mankind, including women. It's not just men. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? The words of God are dependable and trustworthy, since God is dependable and trustworthy. God gave his word by revelation to men who spoke it or wrote it down. God gave the dictation. Men wrote it down, utilizing their vocabulary. God's words are useful. God's words are valuable. They're not empty words. In your Bible, go to Psalm 119. It's in the middle of your Bible. It's the longest book in the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. How about Psalm 119, 105? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It would be a very light halog halogen flashlight today. God's word is a lamp. It's a light down the path to darkness. And how about Psalm 119, 162? I rejoice at thy word as one that finds great spoil. God's word is a treasure of immense value. We should view it as such. We should rejoice in the word of God as one who has discovered a great treasure of incredible wealth. As somebody who's won the lottery. Look, I've won the lottery. I'm rich. Well, 
Don't tell anybody because it's going to change your life. Not very well. So, but God's word will to the good. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found. The word had been lost. It was found in the temple. And what does the prophet Jeremiah do? I did eat them. I devoured them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. God's word was devoured by the prophet as food in a figurative sense. And what he ate became the joy and rejoicing of his heart. The word of God is pure, made up of pure words. Psalm 12, 6 tells us this. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver, tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. The word of God is made up of the words of God. They came by revelation and are pure words placed into his word to convey what he wants known. 2 Timothy 3, 16 again, all scriptures given by inspiration and all scriptures profitable. Since God's word is given by inspiration from God, it can be profitable because it came from God. God inspired the words in the word of God to be written down. They're not the words of men. The words in the Bible are words which the Holy Spirit teaches. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost, which God teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. God in his word has a reason for everything he says, where he says it, when he says it, how he says it, and to whom he says it to. Look at Matthew 4 in your Bible. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, you know, he was hungry. And DoorDash wasn't available, to, you know, to send him food. So the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God. Trying to put a little doubt in there, you know, 40 days without food. Are you sure you're the Son of God? Uh, you know, you're kind of hungry. Why don't you command these stones to be made bread? Right? Little Hawaiian rolls popping up all over the place. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Man should not try to live by bread alone. Right? He needs pizza too. Well, no. Uh, dealing with what we're dealing with here. Instead, man should be extremely better off if he were to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. People should not esteem the word of men more highly than the word of God. The word of God is of more value and is to be more trusted than the word of philosophers, politicians, well, that's easy, doctors, even clergy. Jesus Christ said that man should live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. According to John 4, 24, God is a spirit. The word of God, the Bible, is in the realm of the senses. When God had his word written down, it could then be perceived in the senses realm. By our five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, we cannot register the realities of spirit. However, we can see, hear, and touch God's word in the senses realm. God's word is the declaration of God, who is spirit in the realm of the senses. Let me give you an example. Um, you know, too many people today and throughout history, even those who may be deeply spiritual, seem to accept one part of God's word as true, while dismissing other parts as not the word of God. The entire Bible is the word of God. It's not simply an aided religious devotion. It's not simply one of the great books to be considered among all the other great books of the world. Now, this is the Jefferson Bible. Now, one thing about this is it's a tad smaller than the entire Bible. Well, what Thomas Jefferson was after was, it's not that he didn't believe in the rest of the Bible, he wanted to put all the words of Jesus together in one spot so it'd be the greatest, um, the greatest wisdom and knowledge about God and about how to live life. And he could just read it straight through. In fact, he did it in four different languages. He cut it out uh, from four different Bibles and posted them into his own Bible. In fact, his, that Bible's in the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, but what he was after was just the words, which is tremendous. But all of the Bible is profitable, not just part of it. What God promises in his word, we can learn not only what he is capable of doing, but also what he is willing to do. If God promises he can do something, then he must have the ability to perform it. It must be accessible. 
Romans 4.20, when he, we're talking about Abraham here, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. He didn't doubt the promise of God in unbelief, but instead he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded, he was fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able also to perform. What God promises in his word, he has the ability and he has the willingness to perform. Third John 2 is a great verse. Beloved, I wish, or I pray above all things, that thou mayest prosper, be successful, and be healthy, even as thy soul prosperous, or your soul, your life is successful. The will of God, then, would be prosperity and health. He never meant for the Christians to not have their need met or to be sick. Sickness is never glorifying to God. He never meant for the Christian believer to be full of frustrations and fears and anxieties. God wants his people to prosper and to be in good health. Since the word of God is the will of God, prosperity and health must be available. Philippians 4.19, we read a tremendous verse. But my God shall supply all your need or your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When God declares that he can supply all of our need, not greed, he can supply all of our need, then that is exactly what he means. A supply to fill our need must be available, or God could not fulfill our need. Romans 8.37 tells us, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, through him that loved us. If we are going to be more than conquerors, or be a super conqueror in every situation, it must be possible. How could we be more than a conqueror if the power was not available. So, God's Word is not a collection of philosophical views. It's not an arrangement of ancient uh, tales passed down around the campfires throughout history. It's not made up of fables or lies or forgeries. The words in the Bible are words which the Holy Spirit teaches, given by revelation from God. If we want to tap into the resources for the more abundant life, then we need to understand and recognize that the word of God did not come by the will of man, but that it indeed was given by revelation, by inspiration of God, as holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit.